It is an Ask LOJ edition of Locked on Jazz today. What's the perfect role for John Collins? Are we worried about Keontae Slump? What to do with Lowry in the offseason? Ton of questions, including a dagger question. Trying to is it trying to get me or legit? We'll find out coming up on Locked on Jazz. Bum 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 bum. Pow. No pow. Where's my pow? Pow. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. Thanks so much for tuning in to Locked On Jazz. It's your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for jumping on today's edition of Locked on Jazz and making it your first listen. On today's show, it's an Ask LOJ edition. I love Ask LOJ editions. You guys do such a great job. So what was my take on John Collins and how to use him? If you had your choice in the offseason, Lowry or free agents, what would you do? Is there an all-star type player that's going to ask for a trade? Is Lowry our best player? If Lowry's our best player in three to four years, what's our ceiling? Are you concerned about Keontae George's shooting slump? Why aren't we playing Walker Kessler in drop coverage? Is there a realistic path to winning next year? If the Jazz select number one, what do you think? Do you think it's worth spending assets on Brandon Ingram or Mikel Bridges? If we redraft last year, knowing what we know now, what order do we go? And if the Jazz acquired Mikel Bridges, would that be a deal breaker for you? Or would you just go about it like nothing's wrong? Clark going after me. With a tough question that would have been easy to let go. Summer League, few others, all there. It is all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. This is Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. So thank you very much for tuning in and subscribing and following. Greatly appreciate it to the making it your first listen of the day. To the everydayers, you are the best. We are free and available on all podcasting platforms, apps, whatever you want to call them. Thank you very much. So make sure you. Listen, Spotify, Apple, wherever you are when you're tuning in, driving around town, all those kind of things. All right, uh, let's get to it. So I said on yesterday's program that I thought I finally figured out John Collins. Maybe not. So John Collins has been kind of a mystery to me all season long. Early on, he had big numbers and terrible plus minus, And it felt like his numbers were super shallow. And then, and I was a little flustered by it. Um, we watched John not be able to play with Walker. The word on John when he came was that he was just the ultimate tweener. That as an offensive player, he's a five because he's a roller. And as a defensive player, he's really a four because he's not a good enough rim defender. I'd say he's actually at times been a slightly better rim defender. But on the other end, he's 6'8", and we're 30th in the league defensively as our starting center. So that kind of backs that up. Um, as the year's gone on, I've actually been more and more impressed by John and just come to the conclusion that there has to be a way to use him. That is a way to be successful and uh, could be helpful in the NBA. Like he, he's not a losing player like that. That is my takeaway uh, from the year with John is that there are deficiencies, but he's not a losing player and his numbers aren't entirely false. I, I, I for a while thought that maybe, there were some kind of false numbers to what he does. Um, but I, the more I watched, he's an elite rim finisher. His three-point shooting this year, I mean, he's at 37% for the year. Like, he's a viable stretch aspect that if you don't want to guard him and he's shooting a three, it's probably fine. Now, he's on fire right now from three. Um, So, you know, here's my thought. Most recently, he's played with the with Clint Capella and he played the four and then he got out of sorts there. And then we tried to play him with Walker and that didn't work. So then we started to play him with as a five out center. And I'd say it's been mediocre because of the fact that defensively we're so bad. So the question I have is if, he were to play with a stretch five who could actually defend the rim. Now, yeah, now you're getting to like pretty unique things here. 
Um, is there something there? So, uh, like, if you put John Collins next to Brooke Lopez, is that a huge win? Um, if you put John Collins, like, if he's next to Zubak tonight, I think that's a problem. Um, and, you know, when we've had him as our center and Walker's off the floor, our defense is a 122. Like, it's the 10th in percentile defense. So that's not a great answer. Um, but I wonder, like, when John Collins plays and if he was with Kelly Olenek, do we go back and find out that we're we're okay? But then, Ke- then the defense is even worse because Kelly Olenek's not good defensively. So, yeah, it's a hard mix. But is there a stretch five that defends the rim and then John can be the rolling f- player in the offense because the five is stretched? And then defensively, he can play on the perimeter. So I do still believe in the premise that John's really a tweener and you've got to kind of figure out how to use him to be successful. But I I do think there's got to be a route to be successful. This guy he shoots 37% from three. He's getting you 15 points and nine rebounds. They're not all hollow. I'm impressed by what I've seen out of him this year. Uh, if the choice in the offseason is signing a free agent or getting Lowry's extension done, wouldn't it need to be a bona fide starter to forego Lowry? Does Malik Monk? make it worth not standing Larry. I agree. Like we have cap space, but the fact of the matter is with that cap space, we're probably going to use a lot of that cap space to re-sign Lowry, which would be great. Um, And no, I don't think when we ran through the free agents yesterday that you heard a single free agent that you said, well, if we can get that guy, it's worth giving up Lowry Um, and and moving off Lowry. That, that I I would agree a hundred percent that that, that is very clear. Are there any all-star type players you think may request to be traded this summer and when they even come to Utah? So of the top 20 players on the Ringers top 100 using, they update it the most to their credit. Um, So if you use the Ringers top 100 players in the NBA, I do not think there's a top 20 player who's going to request to be traded in the offseason. Now, we haven't had... They updated this on March 12th, so it's pretty current. We haven't had, hey, Giannis, if Milwaukee falls apart, who knows? But the, it's Jokic, Giannis, Luka, Shea, Joel Embiid, Kawhi Leonard, Steph Curry, Jason Tatum, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker. I mean, if Phoenix doesn't get out of the play and who knows what happens? And if Milwaukee doesn't lose in the first round, who knows what happens? Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Jimmy Butler, Tyrese Halliburton, Donovan Mitchell, he could switch teams, Jalen Brunson, Anthony Edwards, Jamal Murray, De'Aaron Fox is interesting. What happens when Sacramento doesn't get out of the first round? Like, Fox is great. He signed. I don't think they would move him. I could see it eventually. Paul George's player option at the end of the at this year uh, has not been signed. He's 33 years old. What happens if the Clippers lose in the first round to Dallas or New Orleans, which I think is really realistic? Bam, 20, uh, Damata Sabonis, Dame Lillard, Victor Webanyama, Jalen Brown. Boston is in deep in the tax. Are they willing to move someone there? Carl Anthony Towns, Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, Lowry Markinen, James Harden, Trey Young's at 31. So I think Trey Young could be asked out. I don't, you know, we're, we're not at the point yet of the season where we hit the breaking point and things happen, right? Um, Where the pressure cooker heats up and guys revolt and say out. So, I I mean, I think Trey Young's the most likely. He's top 30 of the top 30 players in the NBA. I think that's it. I don't think there's another player in the top 40 players in the NBA who asks out. Um, I do think, you know, Milwaukee, L.A., maybe if New Orleans loses in the first round, Sacramento, I think there's some fragile existence right now in the NBA. Um, thought on Caitlin Clark and the phenomena that is and how incredible it is. Uh, if Lowry's our best player in three to four years, what's our ceiling? Are you concerned about Keontae George's slump? Why aren't player Jazz playing Walker with a drop? And is there a realistic path to winning all things that are being asked on today's edition of Locked on Jazz? 
Today's edition of Locked on Jazz is brought to you by Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. Murdoch Hyundai has got the best lineup of cars you can imagine. I did the research when I bought my Hyundai of all the things out there. What did I find? I said for the dollar, for the safety features, for the bells and whistle features, nobody else matched the dollar of what I could get for my dollar than Murdoch Hyundai. So therefore, the question then to you is whether you like the car or not and whether you want to, um, that's up to you. So the Hyundai lineup of cars from the Kona all the way up to the Palisade, I've bought two Santa Fe's, which are their SUVs. The Ionic 5 is the leading electric vehicle out there. So feel free to email me at dlock09 at gmail.com so I can give you the VIP treatment. That's dlock09 at gmail.com. We'll set you up over at Murdoch Hyundai and get you the VIP treatment that you deserve by being a locked on every dayer. Murdoch Hyundai. Located 4646 South State Street, also in Logan and in Linden, over 80 years in Utah and here to give you the no regrets experience. Today's show is also brought to you by Robinhood, robinhood.com slash boost. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in your own retirement account with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to the IRA with 3% match. That offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription freeze apply now for some legal information. Claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRA and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date for the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available in U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC is registered broker dealer. Robinhood.com slash boost. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Jazz your first listen of the day. Have you made the switch yet to Lockdown Sports today? It's on in the room behind me. It is a 24-7 streaming YouTube channel available for you, and it's pretty great. We're excited to have it, and we're excited for you to jump aboard and try it as well. It is the Right now, for example, it is NC State. Wolfpacks, you're getting the inside scoop on the men and women going to the Final Four from the local experts. If you're tired of all the yelling and screaming from the, whatever ESPN or Fox that you have behind you all day, please uh, drop in and check out. It's uh, This one I'm watching it on YouTube right now. You can watch it on Amazon Fire as well. It's Locked On Sports Today. Go check it out. Um, tonight, Caitlin Clark plays right when we play. And I'm Assuming a lot of people watch Caitlin. I spent a year as the Utah Stars play-by-play announcer. I spent seven years or six years as the Seattle Storm play-by-play announcer to watch the revive this this incredible growth in women's sports is is awesome. I have a daughter's playing Division One athletics right now. Um, I think there's two things I I think I wanted to comment on this just because it's important to me. I know it doesn't directly involve the Jazz, other than you may be watching Caitlin instead of listening to us tonight. Um, number one, the it's awesome. The societal value of this for any of us who have daughters in the world they're about to live in is both obtuse, uh, uh, obvious, and I would say um, subtle. So I was talking to a friend today, and their family you know, is changing what they're doing tonight to go watch the game. Um, that's pretty important. We don't do a lot of things in this world where we stop to watch women. Too often it was Miss America contexts, Victoria's Secret runways. The amount of times 30 years ago you paid to do anything to go see a woman do something was pretty few and far between. I don't want to get into specifics of what they are. So the idea now that we're going to have sold out houses on a universal basis just to watch women play a sport the same way you do to men is astronomically important in the message sending. The other one in this family, specifically that I was talking to, you know, th- their youngest child is, a, I think, a sixth or seventh grade boy. 
there's a pretty big message. I always felt this when I was in the WNBA that when the two girls came and sat in the front row and watched the other women and watch women play professional sports and saw the value of women being spotlighted in a positive manner and a positive athletic body image manner and a positive image, just focus that there was incredible value in the WNBA. It always moved me whenever I saw the young kids, either with mom and dad or by themselves watching a game and watching Super and watching Lauren Jackson or back to the Natalie Williams and Margo Dedick back to the Utah Stars and that they got to see these players play and see them be on the spotlight. What incredible growth and personal pride and feeling of importance that young girls had out of that in a society that wasn't always doing that to them. I thought the other one that was really valuable is when they brought their younger brother and that their younger brother was suddenly being told that women are worthy of stopping to watch and pay to go see, do something. And that was always my feeling during the WNBA. I, I love the WNBA. And I thought the excuses that people use of why they couldn't take their kids to a game were just abs- as just horrendous. Um, and I, I loved the league and I loved being around the women and watching them fight the fight that they, and it was truly, you know, it was, it was hard and trying to break through. And now to see this is, is really moving. I frankly come to tears a lot of times when I'm watching this, just when I watched Nebraska have 92,000 people for a women's volleyball game, my daughter was there um, to have my daughter talk about being on the Nebraska campus as a, as an athlete and the most important and most like the rock stars are the women volleyball players and what it means to her to have women as the rock stars on campus. I mean, these things are really, really important, particularly for everybody in society, those of us who have a daughter even more so, um, or the women that are listening to our show. And I just think it's just take a moment. I just like, I'm going to watch, I'm going to call the game. And I'm going to watch. Cause I just think it's that important. I really do. I really think what's happening for society by Caitlin Clark, it's been growing for a long time. And the rise of women's sports is, is just awesome. And, um, you know, it doesn't happen, honestly, without Title IX, without Billie Jean King, without all these people on the way um, and without Title IX opening the door and maybe, you know, a, a forcing of forcing of the market. Um, it, it but it is that it, I do think it's that important. It's that awesome. And I think then the other part of it is like, frankly, you're also watching now because it's just good. Right. You're not watching out of some societal obligation. You're just watching because it's good. I think it's it's really great. The other one I do think is important in this is. Um, and this is where, like, I think it's important for NBA and player movement. I think this relates a little bit to the jazz and all of our player movement. Um, I think it relates to conference movement. One of the things that's also going here is there's a story. Sports are about stories, about storylines, about people, about, uh, uh, Caitlin Clark is now a story. It's a two and a half year old, three year story that we've been following for a while. And it's crescendoing to this moment. UConn is now a story with their, tw- their years and years and years and years of Gino Ariyama's success. That's crescendoing at this moment. USC playing UCLA and or USC playing watch. Those are still both going to the big 10, but, um, but the, the, you, you know, or rivalries over the years um, matter. And Angel Reese versus Caitlin Clark simply just can't happen in men's college basketball anymore because people are going to move on unless nil suddenly makes it. And rivalries where Iowa has to play LSU a second straight year just doesn't happen anymore. And the, and the we're destroying that in all of our sports, what, what, one of the storylines that should be being talked about in this incredible evolution of women's sports right now is that they actually have stories. They have stories that matter and they have storylines and characters that matter that we get to know a little bit and that we relate to the way we used to when, you know, Georgetown had a run with Patrick Ewing or um, North Carolina had a run with James Worthy and Sam Perkins um, before we lived in this world college. I, I like players going pro. I frankly like them being able to go pro out of high school. So I'm not about to stop that. Conference realignment, I do think is going to be really painful to us because it takes away the stories. So that's just my thought on this. I'm super excited for tonight. I, it's, um, I feel really honored to have been a t- like a part of that origin movement. I think of the late Ann Donovan all the time, who was the old Dominion Center, who was on the Olympic team, and uh, one of the great women players of all time was our head coach in Seattle, and we used to have dinner and talk about it all the time. And I just think about her with this and how she, she's unfortunately passed and what she would be thinking of this and, and how amazing this is. I think of Annie Drysdale, uh, Myers Drysdale, who I know well in Phoenix, and what she must be thinking because she was like one of the first greats. So it's it's really, 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 really cool. Uh, is Lowry, if Lowry is our best player in three to four years, what is our ceiling? So the actually, the question is, if Lowry is as he is today, that's not great, right? Because Lowry, I think we just did, was the 30th best player in the NBA. If your best player is 30th in the NBA, that's a problem. Um, if Lowry evolves to being a top 15 player in the NBA and is our best player, then we're still a little limited. But 
because you need a top 10 and not top 20 and a top 50. I, I think it's unlikely Lowry becomes a top 10 player in the NBA, but just don't get seven foot guys <clears throat> who can shoot it like he can, who can move like he can with his physical strength, who can make those kind of plays. So, there, you know, really the question is what can Lowry do in three to four years to continue to develop um, and to get things going? And that would answer that question. If Lowry's stagnant, certainly if he's our best player is the 30th best player in the NBA, then that's not great. Are you concerned about Keontae George's slump? So I said this a lot on the show. I, I would like to prov- see if I could ignore every minute I ever watched Keontae George without Lowry. Like I'd like to, I'd like to find a way to ignore those. Um, can I? Can we get rid of like that memory and those data points? Keontae without Lowry is really a struggle. Um, and so I think that that's. Um, that's the first thing where I would say no. And let me, can I just kind of forget about those minutes? I do wish I will be a hundred percent transparent here in my thought. I do wish it would make me more comfortable. How's the better way to say it? It would make me more comfortable if Keontae had better shooting numbers in college. The fact that he has sub 40% shooting numbers and sub 33, I think college, maybe he was better than that in college for three and he's doing it again in the NBA has that's, that's a little unnerving. Um, I would also say that I'm a data guy and the data on players that are under 40% from the field and under 33% from three in their rookie year for future success is pretty, yeah, uh, Keontae was 34 from three in college. Those that are under 40% from the field and under 33 from three, which he's not right now, The but he's hovering at it. The only players who've really had success are actually Hall of Famers. It's Jason Kidd, Chauncey Billups, and Russell Westbrook. So, like, to overcome that, you have to be a Hall of Famer. So, those things have me a little concerned, but I do think we're asking him just so much that I probably am not that concerned about it. And I think he's shown enough this year and he was number seven high school kid in the country. Like it, it, it still feels right. Why aren't the jazz playing Walker in drop defense? They have him coming out on screens and we are getting destroyed. So a few things, I think there's a lot of um, defense. They've really changed the way they're playing defense since the all-star break with the intention of teaching more than anything else. So for example, they stopped switching for a long time. They just stopped switching universally, not switching at all in any circumstance, like basically back to the basics, old school, like guard your man. Just recently, they've begun to bring some switching back. Um, And I do think that there's a feeling that you're trying. um, They've really done a pretty good job. I think since the all-star break, they're the fourth best team in the league at denying the three and the fourth best team in the league at denying the, excuse me, fourth best team in the league at denying the rim and the fourth best team in the league at denying the corner three. So they are actually doing a pretty good job in kind of what shots they're getting. Teams are making a very high level and we are last in the NBA in defense in that time period. So certainly I get that that probably overrides all things. Walker specifically in drop. Um, I think they are trying to get him to play point of the screen and then allow the ball handler to get back on the ball more than drop where you allow the ball handler to come. You're kind of in a perpetual switch um, on that. So I think it has to do with fundamental teachings and things of that nature. Is there a realistic pass to winning if the Jazz are selecting number one? What skills in particular are you aiming to acquire? Do you think it's worth spending assets on a multiple on multiple tier two players like Brandon Ingram and Mikel Bridges? Those are the questions that are still left on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. Today's episode of Locked on Jazz is brought to you in part by our friends over at Amazon Fire TV. That's right. Amazon Fire TV is your destination for sports, live games, highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experience with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. 
Whether it's opening weekend of baseball, college basketball tournaments, you're going to want to have Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver constant supply of the latest videos for your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On, most of the big league and conference college conferences as well. Fire TV channels has Locked On Sports today. Also, you can just click on your favorite team and get the immediate highlights and everything else. They have it all broken down, all the content that's there for your team. It's really great. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more. Keep up to date. Go to Locked On Sport. Go to Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. That's Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. If you're a sports fan, you want to have Amazon Fire TV. All right, let's continue with your questions are great. I'm so glad we did points gained yesterday and kept the questions today because there was a plethora of questions and they were really, really, really good. Um, is there a realistic path to winning next year? Are the Jazz solely reliant on draft to top 10 guy? Well, I don't know what winning is defined as. We've proven we can be about a 500 team the last few years um, prior to the trade deadline. Lowry, Colin, Keontae's development, Taylor. I think there, there's a path to being better. Winning has to be defined in that. If winning is 50 games, no. I would not suspect that next year, and I don't really see um, how that happens because I don't – we just ran through the free agent market. It doesn't feel great. We just ran through those all-star players expecting it has to be traded. Didn't seem like there were a lot of them other than Trey. Um, and so – it did, doesn't feel as though there's a lot of routes by which we become a winning team. Um, so are we solely relying on drafting? I think we're solely relying on developing some of our talent, having it mature, and then being able to make the next move. This offseason on Locked on Jazz, we're going to go through all the rebuild models. You know, We're deep enough into it now. We can feel it, see where we are. Um, that. If the Jazz are selecting number one in the NBA draft, what skill in particular are you aiming to acquire? So the first thing I have to be 100% honest about, um, I don't even know who the top, like I can look at the mock draft of the guide and there's a bunch of people who've done great work. Probably nobody more so than Kevin O'Connor and Alex Saar out of France seems to be kind of the number one pick. And then depending on your viewpoint, this kid, the freshman out of UConn um, can, can get there um, pretty quickly up your board. You can watch him this weekend. There's a kid out of Serbia um, and then there's, it doesn't feel like there's another kid out of Lithuania. And then there was Dalton connect who I have huge concerns about at 23 years old. And then there's the big kid out of Connecticut this year that you're watching. And there's two G league ignite guys. So I kind of have an idea, but I don't really know much about them. I, I guess what I would say to answer this question, and maybe it doesn't exist this year is something unique. If you're going to have a number one pick of a draft, you've got to find they're, they're like Taylor Hendricks is unique, his size and length. You've got to find something you just can't find somewhere else. Like there are, there are things that are awfully hard to find. If you have that pick, that's when you have to find it. So is it six eleven, you know, athleticism or something like that? That's, that's what I would think. Do you think it's worth our assets on multiple tier two players as Brandon Ingram and Kel Bridges instead of waiting for a superstar to become available? I do because they make your players better and, and, and you make your, like, if we got Brandon Ingram, arguably be our best player. Um, and then you are better. You have higher end talent matters in this league. And then higher end talent is what you move later along the way. So I do think that, um, yes, if we can get, it's also why like Trey Young's $70 million possible extension is really a problem to me. But other than that, like if you can go get Trey Young, I think you go get Trey Young. Now I know we have a six foot four point guard instead of a six foot one point guard. So maybe there's some reasons with Keontae why you wouldn't do that. But I do believe in like if you can go get I've actually been and I think I was 100 percent wrong on this. I've been a proponent of Zach Levine um, because of the fact that like he just is better than the players we have. And that I think allows you to make the future trade where you get an even better player um, on that. I, I I'm a believer in top tier talent. We, you can win a lot of games in this league with 240 minutes, but you're watching. If you watched both LA and Denver last night, really good game, but boy, they get thin, 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 thin as they go into their, their depth. That's the reality. When you're really good as you get that thin, 
when you're not that good, you might as well acquire 240 of really good talent, 240 minutes of really good talent and beat people that way over the course of the season, but not going to carry in the playoffs. But that's how you get better. And then you use those pieces to move. So, yes, I love these questions. If you uh, redraft last year, knowing what you know about everyone, do we still take the same guy? So, obviously, Victor goes number one. The big change would be Scoot, right? Scoot's not going. I, I think everyone would, would be a little nervous after seeing what we've seen so far this year of whether you're taking Scoot number three. I don't think there's any question Brandon Miller's number two. And I think everyone's pleased with the Thompson twins. The next question really is like, I actually am Bilal Kulabai, Kulabali was a really, really good story early in the year. He, he faded pretty hard here in the second half of the season. Um, you know, it sounds crazy, but Derek Lively, the players who I think would be higher on the draft board are Taylor Hendricks at nine, I think would be higher on the draft board. Cason Wallace at 10 had a great year, but I don't know if he goes higher on the draft board. Derek Lively's had a monster year at 12. Um, Keontae's gotten a lot of time, but I, I don't know that he goes that much higher. And then you have the, the old guys. The, there have been three old guys that have been really good. So Jaime Jaquez obviously goes way up the draft board but does not probably have massive upside and is still only shooting th- for all the love of Jaime Hawkins. He's shooting 31% from three. It's problematic. Braden P- Pajemski has been great, but again, not a huge upside. I think he is what he is. Like, if he- and then Marcus Sasser, not a huge upside, but he's been really, really good. And really what they've been is they've just been ready to play because they're old. That's what you- when you're drafting them, that's what you should be. But like, I know everyone is in love with Jaime Hawkins and he's going to play 2000 minutes and it's awesome. He's also shooting 31% from three is like, this is why he didn't, go further in the draft. He happens to be on the perfect team. So uh, Victor's still number one. Brandon Miller's number two. I think the Thompson twins probably are three and four. Koulibaly might be up there. And then I think Taylor jets up the board. I think Lively jets up the board. Um, But there's just a lot of guys that have played a thousand minutes this year or 500 minutes or 800 minutes. And, and we're just going to have to wait and see. There just have not, you know, I've talked about this. There's either 2,400 minute rookies 1800 minute rookies or 1200 minute rookies. Um, and then I guess there's, you know, eight. So that's the kind of way you look at it. And eventually you want to be a 3200, which is 36 minutes a night. But it's, you know, so we're going to have it. Brandon Miller is going to be a 2400 minute rookie. And Jaime Hawkins is too. And so is Victor. And Keontae is going to play the fourth most amount of minutes of any rookie in this draft. Um, the only other one I would kind of throw out there, the two other guys I think have had pretty decent years, both on really bad teams. So it's hard to tell. Um, Kamara at Port, at, at Portland has played a lot and been okay. 34% from three is okay. Um, Trace Jackson Davis has been pretty darn good in Golden State. And Gigi Jackson uh, was a late pick by Memphis on a not very good team. So um, I think those are interesting uh, to see. But no, I it's a great question. Probably too early to do it. NBA big board probably would do it better than I would. All right. This was the last question of the night. I, I, I'm actually almost missed it because we just got late. But I don't want to dodge it. What would you do if the Jazz acquired Miles Bridges? And would that be a deal breaker for you? And would you just go about it like nothing's wrong? So Miles Bridges has a really, really bad domestic violence charge, and he's guilty of it against him. And um, I think this is a fascinating societal question. I'm probably not going to answer the question, but here's here's the question. Miles Bridges sat out, I think, a year. Miles Bridges probably has lost about $100 million of salary. Okay, rightfully so. I'm not like feeling sorry for him, but that's probably true. And the league has not kicked him out of the league. So we could decide that if you have, we have a one strike policy on domestic violence, that if you have domestic violence, you're gone. The second charge against him got dropped. Okay, so whatever the story around the second charge was, it was dropped. You can decide what you think of that. I'm just going to go with what legally was said is it was dropped. So what do we do? What is our what is one's general feeling? Like it's okay. So we have a player who has committed domestic violence. They ex, they are eligible to play in the league. Is our feeling that it's fine as twenty nine other players get that player, but not our team? That's that's a choice. That we're going to have a standard that no player for our team ever plays that. Do we believe in second chances for people? Do we believe if the league says, or does one believe, it's not have to be a we, if the league says the player's eligible, the player's eligible, they're one of the possible prospects to have in our league, and we are interested in acquiring them. 
So I think it's really a fascinating discussion. It's why I didn't want to not talk about it today. You know, I have a daughter. We talked about women's sports here earlier. Like, you're bringing somebody in who has a massive domestic violence charge on them. It feels uncomfortable. Are we banishing these people to Alcatraz forever? Maybe. Right? Like, might be. Like, what do we do with a 24-year-old young man who has a domestic violence charge? He's paid his, his whatever to society and to his employer, and they still have a chance to be employed. Like, do we... Maybe it is that 29 other teams can have him and we we don't want him. Or it's that that player is eligible to play in our league and we're going to be a place that helps someone progress and advance in life. Um I don't have the answer. But I think those are the those are the questions that have to be answered. That is locked on Jazz today. Have a great one. Thank you very much for being a part of the program. It is I will say this. One thing I will say on that one, when Tom Osborne said that Lawrence Phillips needed football, I thought that was absurd. So I don't buy the idea that someone needs the sport they're playing to prevent them from doing it again because they did the act while they were playing the sport. Okay, so that's I will just I want to just say that like that's the one that really bothers me on that issue. That is Locked On Jazz, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We now send you the first ever twenty four seven national stream Locked On Sports today. Have a great day.